Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Nerds Gone Wild with your friend Chris <laughs> Schultz and his lovely assistant Rick Tyler. Now Rick, today we're going to be talking about competitions. As I gather this seems to be the topic du jour on the VEX forums and I know our support team's hearing a lot about it. So tell me a little bit about how competition works because I'm completely new to VEX and have no idea. Yeah, this season, with the advent of V5, a lot of people are using new software they haven't used before, and there's a lot of concern about how to get your robot to work correctly in a competition. So we're going to go over that today, and we're going to tell you, um, we're going to tell you a little bit how competitions work and how you can write your software to, to work with that and to test your robot, too. Now, we've had some early scrimmages played here at the Robot Mesh uh, office, and I've been able to see that there's two distinct phases to a competition. There's an autonomous section and a driver control. Can you speak a little bit about what happens during each of those phases? Yes, here at Robot Mesh World Headquarters, <laughs> Hi, <yeah. laughs> we are having periodic scrimmages. We had our first scrimmage last week. There's two parts of a match. So the first part of a match well, actually, you know, it's funny. The first part of the match is really putting your robots on the field, getting all the wires hooked up, getting ready to go. Then when the referee goes 3, 2, 1, go, it starts a 15-second autonomous period. And during the autonomous period, you can take a controller like this, and you can play with it all you want, and it will not send signals to the robot. In fact, um, we'll talk about that more in a few minutes, but uh, you can't send signals to the robot during autonomous. Okay. At the end of autonomous, it will stop. The referees tally up the score and record who won autonomous, and then we start the driver control portion of the match. And in the driver control portion of the match, the controller gets turned back on, and then you can actually drive your robots. And one of the challenges, of course, is how do you emulate this in your classroom or your, or your build space? Sure. Now, tell me, are skills challenges different or the same? How do they work? Oh, that's a good point. So, skills challenge, there's two skills challenges. There's a one-minute programming skills challenge and there's a one minute driver skills challenge. Um, your total robot skill score is the sum of those two, of your two best scores in those two events. The programming skills looks just like autonomous mm -hmm. and the driver skill looks just like driver skill. So, so during, for example, during programming skills your controller won't work. Okay. Now, I see some different pieces of hardware here on our table. Can you tell me a little bit about this competition switch that I've heard so much about on the VEX forums? Yeah, well, surprisingly enough, we actually have a competition switch because one of the things I've discovered about competition switches is that they have feet and they like to hide. Oh, okay. But we actually have one of the rare and elusive guys here, and we've managed to label ours robot mesh so we keep track of it. The way this works is it has four, it has four standard Ethernet ports. You get one cable per robot. So we just have one robot, so we're just going to test with one robot here. And I take that cable and I plug it into my the competition port on my controller. If you have a Cortex joystick, it's pretty much the same thing. It's the same hole. You okay. plug it in the same way. And now the um, competition switch has control of what's going on. And it's always a good idea in the competition switch to note that there's two switches. Extremely complicated, there's two switches. One of them is disable and enable. Really? So if I put it to disable, what do you think it does, Chris? I don't know. You tell me, Mr. Tyler. It means the robot won't do anything during disable. But interestingly, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about this more later, even though you've disabled the robot, the code on the computer, the code on the brain of the robot is still running. Oh, okay. Interesting. It's just that it won't do anything when it's in the disabled mode. I did not know that. I know that most, I don't think most people do, but your code is still running. Um, the reason it doesn't look like it's doing anything is that in the disable mode, the motors are all turned off. So no matter what your program does, the robot can't move because the motors won't move. So the other switch is mode. It's either driver mode or autonomous. Okay. And we talked about the two parts of the match, autonomous portion and the driver portion. Right. Right? So if I'm using this to test my robot, I will turn my robot on. And I'm going to start my program running on the robot. Oops, sorry, I'm going to turn, going to turn the uh, controller on. So the controller's on. It's paired with the robot. If you can see it on the camera there, you would notice that the red, the red radio is now flashing here to tell you that it's connected. And it's working. In the Cortex world, there's a series of, red li uh, a series of colored lights. And when they're in the right pattern of colored lights, we call those the happy lights. Oh, okay. And the happy lights mean that you're good to go. Um, so we're plugged in. We've got to, we're going to run the program. 
And when I throw the switch to autonomous mode, which is what I'm going to do here, I'm going to put it in autonomous mode, which is down, I'm going to enable it. My autonomous code should run on the robot. And this is just a simple autonomous that drives straight for a little bit, then it turns, and then it stops. So we can, when our robot's done, we can disable it. It does not have a timer on the competition switch, so really you use a, a stopwatch or a cell phone or something to time your 15 seconds. Okay. And then when you're done, you disable it. Then when you want to try driver control, and we're going to let the, the lovely Chris Schultz be the driver here. All right. Um, I'm going to now put it in driver mode, and I'm going to enable driver mode. And now it should. Now, Rick, would you be able to put your hands by those wheels so I can just see how fast these motors go? Well, yeah, let me stick my finger in here. <laughs> I think I'm winning. Yeah, you're the winner. I think, I think this, yeah. is a, this is a good robot to have in competition. Especially yeah. if our coding had something that made the claw work, it would probably be a little more efficient. Yeah, uh, maybe it's not that good of a program yeah. after all. And then when you're done, you disable it. Okay. So really, you just manually time it, and this switch lets you turn on and off. And the great thing is it'll turn on and off four robots at a time. I have been at tournaments back in the dark early days of VEX where the field control hardware failed so hard that we ran a whole tournament on the competition switch. We just had all four, there's four robots in the field, each one plugs into a port, and we had the referee just start and stop the matches by hand. Yeah. Haven't heard of that one in a long, long time though. Now that brings up an interesting segue to our next topic here. As I understand, are these uh, competition switches, they're not strictly legal for competition, they're really used for practice, aren't they? Correct. Occasionally in a tournament you'll see the skills field will run off of one of these rather okay. than a computer. It depends on the resources at the event. Um, most events now have a have a skills computer for the skills challenge, but but you may see these at the skills field because they just need to put it in auto and enable it for 60 seconds and turn it off, and it's the same as if you had the other stuff. But in a turn in a match, you never see these in a match anymore. So what is this other piece of hardware then that we're using in the match, and how is it different from the competition switch? Sure. Well, you take a cable. Oh, wait a minute. This is a smart cable from a V5 robot. This doesn't actually fit anything we're doing, so let's get rid of that. Um, what, the, what they're doing in a tournament is they have something called a match controller okay. that has, a, in fact, you can tell this one's got tape and labels on it and stuff, and it's got a thing on the back. These, this has been used, in fact, this one actually has a team name on the back. We might have stolen this from a team. Um, it's the, Cable says robot mesh though. So it's got a USB A to B cable. You plug it in here, you plug it into the tournament manager computer, and then this goes off to, well, usually it's a 50 foot cable to the control tower here. Um, we don't have tournament manager running right here, so we're not gonna show you how that works. But this is the same, this does the same thing that the competition switch does. The computer sends a signal to this, which then sends it down the wire to here, and your robot your robot controller is plugged into the tower, and now you're, whoops, so I made a mistake. I forgot to turn off the program, it's still running. There we go. Um, so this is plugged into the tower. The tower is plugged into the match controller. The match controller talks to the software, and when, you, when, the, when the scorekeeper who's running the scorekeeping software hits the match start button, it runs autonomous for 15 seconds. 15 seconds. And when that's done, it stops, waits for the referee to say, one, two, three, go again, and then the scorekeeper hits the button to go to driver control. Okay. But you remember that down at the electrons, these, these electrons on this wire are pretty much the same electrons as you get out of the competition switch. This does 90% of what this does. But this, does, but this actually does a couple of things more. Oh, does it? Like what? Well... So I'll tell you one thing it doesn't do. So there's a been a common belief in the VEX community almost since time began that this is somehow sending magic commands to your robot. And people have said in the past, for example, that my left drive motor doesn't work because the field controller is turning my left drive motor off. That's crazy, Rick. Let me put on my tinfoil hat. It is a tinfoil hat. <laughs> and then your robot will spray chemtrails all over the sky. Um, no, what, what really, what really does, it only does two things. Um, there's multiple radio channels that VEXNet uses on the Cortex. Um, one of the channels is kind of one of the channels is kind of reserved for competitions. So the field controller actually tells your VEXNet which radio channel to use, and it will tell you to use the competition channel during a match. Um, the other thing, but other than that, it doesn't do anything. So the only thing it does is it turns it on or off, and it tells it which VEXNet channel to use. I actually, to be honest with you, I'm embarrassed to admit this, I don't know if V5 makes use of that anymore or not. Hmm. V5, the V5 radio protocol is completely new and may not even use that secret channel switching feature anymore. 
but I guarantee you that this has no way to tell the robots on your mo the motors on your robot to turn on or off individually. The only thing it does is during is when your driver and autonomous aren't running, it turns everything off. All right. So this brings up another question. Um, I'm hearing a lot about this pre-auton um, function in the con competition templates when we're talking about software and programming. What exactly is pre-auton all about, and do I need to care? Yeah. So really, if you look at a look at a program that's a competition program, you've got an autonomous thread and you've got a driver control thread. And in the when the autonomous and those are both controlled by something called VexOS. VexOS is lives on the brain or on the cortex. It's the low-level software that makes all the mechanisms work. So when you write your code in Robot Mesh Studio and Python or C++ or Blockly, it's all talking to that VexOS layer. So the VexOS controls the hardware, and the program you write talks to that VexOS. Okay. So what VexOS does is VexOS tells your program um, start the autonomous thread, and then start the driver control thread. Unless one of those, if you're running a competition program, unless one of those threads is running, um, nothing will happen because the motors are all turned off. So the, the interesting thing, though, is that you can have three threads on your brain. You can actually have 50 threads, but you can have three threads. You could have the autonomous thread, the driver control thread, and the main thread, or the, uh, the main thread. And the main thread can do anything, and that main thread runs whenever the brain's turned on. So what a lot of people used to, a lot of people in the past, because Robot C called that pre-autonomous, mm -hmm. they thought pre-autonomous was a thing. It's not really a thing, it's just a thread that runs that doesn't require the autonomous or driver control thread to be running. And in that thread, what you normally would use that thread for is like, especially with like the new vision sensor, you might turn the vision sensor on while the robot is sitting there on the field waiting for the master to turn the vision sensor on and just see if you can see any vision targets. Maybe you can find a vision target in the, before your autonomous even starts. Now, strictly speaking, do you need an autonomous template or could you do this without? You could do it without. Actually, in the robot mesh world, if you use Blockly, you pretty much need to tell it you've got a competition program running. And we're going to add to the bottom of this video with me and the lovely Chris, uh, we're going to add a uh, demonstration of how to set up a program in Robot Mesh Studio to be a competition program. And I believe but, it works for Python as well in Robot Mesh Studio. Yeah, in an okay, so Python is C plus plus. There's there's actually a more there's a more um, sophisticated way to do it too. But at Blockly, you just tell it it's a competition program and it sets it up. Python is C plus plus. You can check the box and it will create that too. But if you know how to write the code, you actually don't even need to check the box. You can just type it in yourself. So it depends on how how large okay. your brain is, you know. It's like, Excellent. So I think this is as we'll, good. A, and we'll go over that. We'll go over that separately. We'll have other. We'll, we'll have a deeper dive on how to program C plus plus and, and Python in another video. In fact, it should be in the next video. <laughs> With this edition of Robot Mesh on YouTube, thank you for following, and we'll see you in the next video where we'll talk a little bit more about how to use the competition template using Blockly. Thanks, everyone. And hey, you all be careful out there. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, Rick. Happy Thanksgiving, Chris. Like 2018, this video is made.